I feel like God has, gave me, has given me a word that would be very appropriate for today. My message theme this morning is a prayer for the new year. A prayer for the new year. This is our first service this year. Amen? Am I right? It's our first service. Isn't it interesting that many times we preach New Year's messages on, on making sure that, you know, if you make commitments to keep them, and we try to build ourselves up to go and, and, and walk in the anointing of God. We remind us that God wants us to prosper and be in good health. Many times we focus on ourselves. Amen? But I'm going to focus on our relationship with him for a few moments. A prayer for the new year. Colossians chapter 1, turn with me. A prayer for the new year. I feel like God's given me a word for this morning and for tonight for you. You don't want to miss it because tonight's going to be a very, very special night. And it's going to take participation from all the believers that really believe and trust God for a victorious year. Colossians and chapter 1. Colossians and chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Verse 2, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are, at, who are in Colossia. I'd like to put who are at Faith Outreach Center. Paraphrase, amen. To the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ who are at Faith Outreach Center, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know God wants us to walk in peace? He wants us to trust him. In these days of turmoil, in these days of, of indecision that we see around the world, this is the time that we really need to put our trust in him. Amen? And not only put our trust in him, but don't put our trust in him wringing our hands. Put our trust in him and say, God, you're my peace. You're more than enough. Then in verse 9, then in verse 9, this is, just, this is an incredible connection to God. This is, speaks of prayer. And I want to talk about the prayer of a new year. Prayer of a new year. I'm going to ask you and me to come into an attitude of prayer, praying for one another. Pray for the church body. Pray for the church at large. Amen. Do you know the church is under pressure right now? Do you know there's people leaving the church by droves? Do you know that, uh, that churches are closing down every day? Churches, not just little small churches with 20 people, large churches are, are closing down. How many of you know that's not God? Unless the people are just not operating in the anointing, God can close the door, of course. But it's God's desire that the places that's been dedicated and that's this been, this been anointed and ordained for him should stay operating. That Jesus said the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. Do I hear an amen? So as I see Paul's heart towards the people, I find there's a great flow and a great anointing. I want you to look in first, at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. For this reason... For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it. Since we heard of what? What's Paul talking about? Well, you'll find it in verses, in, in verses 3 uh, through 6. Uh, first of all, it says in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 3, we give thanks uh, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Praying always for you. Paul said it's very vitally important that prayers go up uh, for the body of Christ. Amen? Since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and in your love uh, for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word, and that is the word of truth of the gospel, uh, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and, in, and is uh, bringing forth the fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and you knew the grace of God of truth. Because of that reason. 
in verse 9, because of that reason, what I just read to you, we also, since the day we heard it, uh, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all the wisdom and spiritual understanding. If you notice and read that scripture close, you'll find out Paul's not talking about frivolous stuff. Lord, give us a bigger house this year. Give us, give us more cars to drive. And, 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 and Lord, that we might be able to have more money to, to enjoy ourselves. We might sit back and enjoy the luxury of the Christian life. Paul's not praying for those kind of things. There's ten things uh, that he commissions us or he prays over us that we might walk in. Ten things. I'm going to give them to you. For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, did not cease to pray for you and ask, number one, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Think about that. Think about what he knows and think about what we know. Compare our knowledge to his knowledge. Oh my goodness, sometimes I think about God and how great he is. I don't think I know anything. I used to think I knew some things about the word of God, but the more I study the word of God, the more I realize I don't know anything. And someone will say to me, hey, Pastor, why don't you preach on, uh, on the, the, the beast? You know what I say? I'm not qualified. I don't know enough about it. But why don't you spend more time, uh, Pastor, letting everybody know when the movie's going to take place? You know why? I'm not qualified. The more I study the Word, the more I find out I don't know too much about it. It, is, it has been my goal for the last 40 years to hide the Word in my heart, to study the Word, uh, to know and understand the things of God. But then I read this prayer that Paul cries out, that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. Oh Lord, help me to be filled with the knowledge of Your will. We don't even know what His will is for our personal life. We're not even sure what God really wants us to do. We, we have an unction and we have an idea. And there's so many people that have been in the Lord for many, many years and still don't know what the will of God is for their life. But Paul says, be filled with the knowledge. Knowledge means understanding. Knowledge means, uh, means insight. Knowledge means knowing the heart of God for His will in your life. And then the second, and then number two, uh, that we may be filled with all wisdom. All wisdom. How many of you know wisdom needs to be a primary thing? Not the wisdom of man. Not to be able to invent a bigger computer. And not to be able to have so much knowledge that we destroy ourselves and we're self-destructing even in our generation with how much knowledge we have. We've got more helps and we've got more things that should make life easier. And, and when you ask somebody, how are you doing? They're saying, I'm just so busy. And we've got cell phones. We've got computers. And we've got text messages. And we've got, uh, we've got all the different aids to help us. And we're still overcrowded with being so busy that we don't have time to even have relationship. But we need His wisdom. We need the wisdom of God to be penetrating our lives and show us how he wants us to operate. And then number three, you may be filled with the knowledge of his will uh, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I think the problem with the world today is they don't have enough spiritual understanding. In all the things that have taken place in the last several months, and I'm not going to bore you with it or bore myself with talking about some of them, but I don't hear, I haven't heard hardly anybody ask, what does God think? What's the will of God in this situation? What does God want us to do to bring our country to the next level? What's God's, uh, what's God's heart? Uh, what's God's spiritual, well, I want spiritual understanding on what God thinks about it. I haven't heard any of that. Because uh, we, have, we are living in a society uh, where we're concerned about our own understanding and our own wisdom and we're leaving God out. So three things uh, uh, Paul is crying out in behalf of the church. You may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Uh, you may uh, walk in his wisdom. That you might have spiritual understanding. 
Uh, number, uh, number four, uh, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. That we may walk worthy of the Lord. That's a heavy statement right there. Can anybody agree? That's not a light statement. That I might walk worthy of the Lord. Uh, that I might be able to say, Lord, you've given me the instructions, you've given me the outline, and God, I'm going to walk worthy of being called your child. That I may walk worthy of the Lord. And then it says, fully pleasing him. Fully, not half-heartedly pleasing him. Uh, not pleasing him once in a while. Fully pleasing him. That's the thing that Paul is crying out for the church to be able to get insight and revelation on. Is anybody with me? And then being fruitful in every good work. Lord, let me be fruitful. Let me bear fruit in my life. Uh, let, at the end of the race, and I, when I finish my course, I can hear, well done, thy just and faithful servant. But Lord, somewhere along the line, I can say that I bore good fruit and I touched somebody's life and I impacted somebody with the power and the anointing of God. Is somebody with me? Fulfilled with good, pleasing Him, uh, being fruitful in every good work. And then, and, and then here's the next one. Are you ready? Uh, uh, fruitful in every good work. Bearing fruit. That's uh, number six. Number seven. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. How many of you want to increase in the things of God? Increase. And that means that our life should be a little bit better tomorrow than it is today. That means next week there ought to be something different taking place in my life that I can impact somebody with the power and with the anointing and increasing in the knowledge. I want more knowledge of God tomorrow than I have today. And then in verse 11, strengthened with all might. Strengthened. I want to be strengthened in the might of the Lord. I want to be strengthened in the presence of God. How do I want to be strengthened? According to His glorious power. I don't want to be in my own strength, not by might, not by power, by thy spirit, saith the Lord. I want to be strengthened in the spirit. Amen? Amen. Strengthened in, the, in His glorious power. Think about the glorious power of God. You know what the glorious power of God is? The anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost to move, move and penetrate us. Church, this isn't just a scripture. This is a prayer. Paul is praying this. He's praying this. He's, he's asking, oh God, let the church be manifested in these things. All, and then he says, in all patience. And then he said, long suffering with joy. Do you know long suffering isn't always joyous? Has anybody ever been in something for a long time? You said, is this ever going to come to an end? You felt like, uh, it felt like you was up against the wall and couldn't get a breakthrough. Is it ever going to come to an end? I can imagine how, how Job felt. Is it ever going to come to an end? Long suffering with joy. James said, consider it all joy when you go through trials and tribulations because the testing of our faith. And those are ten things I just gave you that Paul prayed over the church that we might be that we might manifest his power and his anointing. And if we do, if we do, then it'll bring five other things into your life. Are you ready for them? Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. What's giving thanks to the Father? That's prayer. Amen. Amen. When I give thanks to the Father, I'm I'm communicating with him. What's prayer? Communication is with the Father. Giving thanks to the Father who qualified us, what? To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Hallelujah. That's one of the benefits uh, that Paul's trying to say. If we'll walk in these ten things, it'll bring forth, it'll cause us to be partakers of the, of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That's what walking in Jesus is all about. Amen. Then in verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Now that's worthy of saying praise God. I said he's delivered us from the power of darkness. Power of darkness is broken because of Jesus. He is the light. And then transform us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Hallelujah. Transform us, God, to be like Jesus, to, to be imitators of him, to walk in the kind of love that he walked in. And then in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah. I'm forgiven because of him. I'm righteous because of him. I'm redeemed because of his blood. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say I'm redeemed. Hallelujah. This is a prayer. This, should, this, this could be the prayer of the new year for us. Oh Lord, let this prayer come alive in my heart. Let this prayer come alive in the hearts of Faith Outreach Center. Let us realize that one of the most important things we can start with this year is not making resolutions for a change because most of the time we don't keep them. Not make all these great declarations that probably after one or two times we forget about them. Let's, let, let's, let the prayer of this new year penetrate us and say, God, I want this to happen to me. Amen? Amen? Then I'm reminded of Psalm 37 and verse 4. It says, delight yourself. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Well, Pastor, I've got a lot of desires in my heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give them to you. There's a lot of people that are wanting things and want God to do things in their life. They've been crying and praying, asking God to heal somebody, asking God to bring a loved one to him, asking the anointing to fill your house, asking God to, uh, to move mightily in a situation that hasn't been happening. Now, listen, if we delight ourselves in him, it shall happen, the Bible says. Our attitude towards God is, is a prerequisite to what takes place in our life. There are some amazing prayers in the Bible. You ever think about that? Did you ever stop and think about all the prayers? If you go through the Bible, you'll find there's prayers all through the Bible. When people were in trouble, they prayed. When people needed a breakthrough, they prayed. Amen? But when the countries was coming apart, when there was war, they prayed. When the enemy came in and, and, and attacked uh, the children of Israel, they prayed. I'll give you just a few of them, and I got so many. Of them, they'll, they'll, <clears throat> I don't have time, but Abijah's army uh, needed victory, and they prayed for victory in the battle in 2 Chronicles 13. Abraham prayed for a son in Genesis 15. Abraham prayed for an Ishmael, that Ishmael, would, God would bless him in Genesis 17. Abraham at Sodom prayed and asked God if there would be so many people, would he spare Sodom in Genesis 18. Abraham for healing of Abimelech in Genesis 20. Abraham servant for guidance in Genesis 24. The centurion prayed for his servant in Matthew 8. The children, uh, the Christian disciples prayed for boldness in Acts 4 and verse 29. The Christian prayed for, uh, the believers prayed for Peter in Acts 12 and Cornelius for an enlightenment in his life in Acts 10 and the thief on the cross prayed for salvation to Jesus at the very last breath of his life. Daniel prayed for an interpretation in Daniel 2 and, and Daniel prayed for the Jews in Daniel 9 and David for blessings in 2 Samuel 7. David prayed for direction in 1 Samuel 23. And David cried out with a repentant heart in Psalms 51 when he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore within me the joy of my salvation. Oh, there's many prayers. Sometimes I wonder if we realize the power and the importance of prayer in our life. We have a prayer team that meets on Saturday. The report I got is they had a great time yesterday. And God spoke to them about some things, even confirming my message this morning. This is my prayer for you in the new year. Oh Lord, that you would give us spiritual understanding and wisdom. That we might have the knowledge of your will. That we might walk worthy of you, O oh Lord, and fully pleasing you and we might be fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. and We might be strengthened with all might and according to your glorious power, we might have patience and long-suffering with joy. Oh God, let this be the prayer of the saints this morning. Let this be the, uh, let this be the starting of, uh, of, of the new year, 2013, that we're committed to God and oh God, that you might flow through us. And church, I'll tell you, if we delight ourselves in these things, these other things will be added unto you. 
Paul's prayer for the church at Colossians was a prayer for perception. What does perception mean? Perception is understanding. If I perceive something, I understand something. Isn't that right? For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, did not cease to pray for you. <clears throat> and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Perception. Paul was asking, oh God, give the church perception. Give the church understanding. Church, let prayer be important to us. It's interesting to me through the years, almost 30 years of pastoring Faith Outreach Center, that if we have a special speaker come in and he was going to come in and tell us how to prosper, the church would be full. If we were going to have somebody come in and, 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 and tell us how the joy of the Lord can be big in our life, if we have some principles, we'll come hear it. But then we call a prayer meeting and a few faithful saints will come. And yet Paul is telling us how important prayer is. Prayer is the very essence of communicating with God and connecting with God. We need to be able to have perception of what God, who God is and what he has to say. Amen? Amen? Paul prayed for the church that they would be able to understand and perceive the will of God. Lord, let me understand the will of God. I'm not sure we really understand the will of God. When we use that phrase so lightly, we say the will of God and I would know him and we quote the scripture and that Paul said that I would know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. But do we really perceive, do we really understand how important it is to know the will of God in my life and your life? How are you going to do God's will if you don't understand what it is that God wants you to do? If we don't understand what God wants us to do, I can never fulfill the will of God. There's people all over the Christian community that have talked about, oh, I, I should have made a missionary trip. Oh, I should have, I, I should have uh, uh, preached the gospel. Oh, I know I'm supposed to do this, and I know I'm supposed to do that. And, but maybe I will later after the kids are raised. Maybe I will later whenever, I'm, I don't, whenever I retire and I don't have this responsibility of this job. And we have all kinds of reasons why we have not fulfilled the will of God. And then we wonder what happened. <clears throat> And then I believe God, after a while, will take that burden away from us if we don't act upon it, and he'll give it to somebody else. I'll tell you why this church is here, 7607 Sheldon Road. When we chose this property, Vicki, you remember we chose this property. It was just an empty lot. It was a soccer field that they couldn't get. It. The people that bought it to make a soccer field out of this property right here, they couldn't get it zoned commercial, so they sold it, and we bought it. And after we started, we had our vision written down. We started the church. We built the first building. We was having church. The anointing of God was flowing. A man came from the church down the street. He came with tears in his eyes after a service, and he came and told me, Pastor, I want you to know, he said, I read your vision. I heard what, I hear what you're preaching and what you're saying. Why God has you here? He said, I want you to know, five years ago, my pastor had the exact same vision down the street. He was told that he was supposed to do this and do that and touch the community and have outreaches and have missionaries around the world and, and, and reach the world with a Bible college that would impact the people's ministry and have, and have a school for the children. He said for five years, God told him to do that and he kept putting it off. He said, just so you know, you're here because they wouldn't do it. Now God has you here to do it. What a confirmation for us. And I made a commitment to God right then. I said, oh God, don't let me be like that person. Don't let me talk about what you want to do and talk about how you're going to do it and say, oh, we've got this vision and five years from now, we haven't done anything. Oh Lord, let me get it done right now and let me start making headway right now because I want to walk in your will. <laughs> Hallelujah. The will of God. We need to understand the will of God. And then not only that, but we need to understand the Word of God. I said the Word of God. Are you with me? The Word of God, Colossians 1, chapter 10. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord, 
by pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. Oh, listen, God wants us to know his word. He wants us to know his word. Last night as I was studying, God was placing this message in my heart. I couldn't help but to remember how many Bibles that I read that my dad had. And I went to my shelf and I've got two or three of them. I pulled the old Bible out. My dad was a King James man through and through. And I took that old King James Bible out. That my dad, uh, the last one that he had, and I opened it up, and it was marked from cover to cover. Amen. Every book, he had little drawings, and, and he, he, was a, he was a sketch artist. He could draw anything. He would have little drawings of all the different main events in the Bible. He would have it underlined and circled and written in colors. And, 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 and at the end of his life, at 80, 84, 85 years old, he was hungry for the word. He was in the word every day and it changed his life. What a legacy to leave uh, that the word impacted you so much uh, that everybody knows that the word was important to you. The word of God. The word of God will bring increase of knowledge. The word of God will bring understanding. The word of God will bring spiritual wisdom. It's in the word. In fact, I believe that every situation and every problem that there is it can be solved with the word of God. Maybe I have a hunger for the word because my dad had such a hunger for the word. Maybe I got a hunger for the word because I realized when I first got called in the ministry that the word was going to be the very essence of, of, of success and it was going to be the, where I was going to find the truth to all things. Because when you find the truth, the truth will set you free. It's impossible for me to fully explain how important the Bible is in my life and in your life. It doesn't matter how old you are. The Bible is still all in all. You might be, a t you, you, you might be in grade school and, and, and starting out your educational experience. Let me tell you, teach the little children the word of God and as they grow older, they won't depart from it. Teach him, teach him in school and teach him in the home. The word of God, the power of God's word and you'll find them as little children laying hands on each other and praying for them and believing God and, and asking God to move mightily when, it's, when there's no other answer. You might be a teenager when all of your friends have turned their backs on God and on the church and they've gone the way of the world. Let me tell you, if the word of God is rooted and grounded in you, it'll change you forever. You won't walk away from it. A lot of people think the Bible is just a book of fairy tales and, and things of unimportance. Oh, let me tell you, when you read, the, when you read your Bible, you get your thoughts for the year and you'll get anchored and you'll, get, and you'll know God's way in your life and you won't depart from the truth. Maybe you're 20 years old and you're saying, well, what about me? It might not be popular in the areas of the young adults these days. The young adults feels like, you know, humanism might be the thing. There's a little bit of truth in all of it. So we'll just dabble around with a little bit of all of it and, and, and it doesn't matter because one way or the other they'll get there, but that's not what the Bible says. You might be in your 30s or your 40s while, re while still raising your children and having teenagers and young adults in your life. You're going to need the encouragement of the word. You're going to need the Bible to stand on because that has the answers to the things that you don't have answers for. I don't know about you, but I found out whenever my first child came into, in, in, into the world and I was found myself raising a, 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 a little child, I didn't have an operator's manual. They didn't come, no, a manual didn't come with it. I'm an old automobile mechanic and I know how to take a manual and make it work and read stuff and know how to fix things. But there was no manual for that. When we start raising our teenagers and they start to go in rebellion and they want to do it their way and they didn't want to listen to it, I didn't have no manual to tell me what to do. But I went to this manual. I went to the book, the life-changing book that tells you how to raise your children and, and tells you how to bring them up in the ways of the Lord and tells you to uh, don't spare the rod because there's a time correction is necessary. Maybe you're in your 50s or 60s. 
Oh, let me tell you, read your Bible because it'll leave a legacy of godliness that'll pass on the passion of God's word to the next generation. Maybe I have the passion for God's word because I've always remembered my mom always being in the Bible. It was her life. My dad would read one Bible after the other and mark it up and give it away to somebody and get into another one. Then the next thing is so important as Paul prays these prayers is he wants us to prosper. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to walk in the anointing of God and have more than enough. But let me tell you what prosperity really is. I've heard, I've heard the church confuse prosperity. I've heard the church preach that prosperity is to have more and have more things and have more stuff. That's not what prosperity is. Here's prosperity, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. If you have a family that loves you and you got somebody to put their arms around you and walk with God with you, you're prosperous. That you may walk worthy with the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Being fruitful, that's prosperity. Being fruitful in the things of God. In every good work, an increase in the knowledge of God. Increase. Here again, Paul's praying for us to prosper in two different areas. Number one, he prays that we would prosper as we walk in the things of God. They might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. When we do that, you will prosper. When you do that, you'll have enough. Are you listening to me, church? Listen, let this prayer be the prayer of the year for us. Let it start our very year by, uh, by walking in these things. And, and God will cause the whole year uh, to be prosperous. He said, I would that you would prosper and be in good health. How? Even as my soul prospers. As I grow in him, the other things will be there. As I grow in the anointing of God, God will open up the windows of heaven and cause me to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. And not only walk, but work. We don't like that word work. Being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful in every good work. How many of you know ministry is hard work? How many of you know living for God's hard work? How many of you know being faithful to God uh, takes, uh, takes lining up with God's word because there's all kind of oppositions pulling at us from every direction? Being fruitful in every good work. That's a good prayer, isn't it? Being fruitful in every good work. As we serve God this year, I pray that the work that we do for Jesus Christ will produce more fruit than ever before in your life. I'm claiming, uh, I'm claiming fruit uh, to come out of your life. I'm claiming that all your needs will be met this coming year as we walk in the abundance of God. I'm praying you'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out and blessed in the city and blessed in the country. All that you put your hands to shall be blessed. I'm praying this prayer over you, church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that ye labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, you can't outgive God, you can't outserve God, you can't outwork God. Everything you do, he's going to be a rewarder for those that diligently seek him. Paul prayed that the church could be able to perceive or understand the will of God. Paul prayed that the, word of, that the word of God might come alive in us. Paul prayed that they would be prosperous in every way as they walk and they work in the things of God. And then the last thing he prayed, that we would have the power of God to sustain us. Listen, we need power today. We need the Holy Ghost power. And we need the word of God power. And we need to rise above the circumstances that so easily put us down and, 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 and discourage us and say, my God is able to deliver me. There's nothing that will overtake me because my strength is in Him. Verse 11 of Colossians 1 says, Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power and to all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. The Colossians needed the power of God in their day to live victorious for Jesus and so do we. If I ever needed the anointing, I need it today. If I ever needed his understanding, I need it today. 
If I ever needed God's power, I need it today. And I wonder, maybe if we would spend more time in prayer, more time seeking God's face, we would find these things coming together. We would find uh, the, that God would uh, cut a path in, in the midst of the opposition. And we would find we would have the endurance that we need. Somebody say endurance. He said unto all patience and long suffering. That's endurance. If I'm going to have patience, that's endurance. If I'm going to suffer long, I've got to have endurance. I can't quit. I've got to have tenacity. I've got to hang in there. I've got to believe God. He's going to see me through. And then the last one is, God wants us to, to enjoy his presence. Enjoy his presence with joyfulness. He wants to have joy in our heart, church. Joy about our Christian life. The joy about serving God. It can't be burdensome. It can't be woe is me. I hear a lot of people complain about, about how tough it is to serve God. Let me tell you, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Sure, there's some opposition. Sure, there's some tough times. But for 30 years of being in this ministry, 90% of it has been the joy of the Lord. If it's nothing but drudgery, it's time for me to get out. If it's nothing but hard times, it's time for me to say, let somebody else do it. But it's not that way. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I love serving Him. I love being in, his, in the main, in the will of God. I love being where I am with God. How about you? Are you happy that you're serving God? What a prayer. Lord, like the Colossians, help us to understand your will. Help us to hunger for your word. Help us to prosper as we walk and as we work for you. Help us to walk in your power with endurance in the difficult times and enjoy the journey. Amen? Are you with me? I'm going to pray in just a moment, but listen, church. Let this prayer grip your heart. Let this prayer be something that you start your year off with. Here's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to ask everybody to come back tonight. When I do that, most of you, many of you don't connect with me, but I'm going to ask you to come tonight. Here's the reason why. Because we're going to give the first fruits of prayer to the Lord tonight. We're going to bring our prayers to the altar. I'm not going to take time to pass out prayer cards. We're going to have them out there in the lobby. Pick up one. Fill it out. But what do you believe in God for for this year? Let's pray together over it. When I go off and fast and pray, many times I'll have people fill out cards, and there'll be two or 300 cards, and I'll labor over them for hours and hours, praying over every card, reading every one. Many times the same person will give me three or four cards with different things. I'm not going to do that this year. I feel it's going to be more effective as the first fruits of our prayer tonight. Bring your prayer to the altar. Maybe there's a family need or a marriage need or children need to be touched with God or some singles that need to have prayer or single parents that are trying to raise their children. Maybe somebody needs a job or finances. Maybe your youth need to be lifted up or our young adults or there's a healing or divine healing needs to be in your life or... Maybe loss of a family member and a loved one. Maybe you want to get them into the fold. They don't know Jesus, but you, you've been praying, but they haven't come in yet. Maybe a co-worker needs to be saved, or missionaries, or sister churches, home and abroad, or the suffering Christians around the world, or the decline of church attendance, or the ungodly attitude in our society today, and that we'll be drawn closer to him. Let's pray about that tonight. Would you dare write prayers down? Would you dare come with me and let's get on our face before God and pray over our needs and we'll have them all over the floor. We'll have them all over the altar. You can write them down and fold the paper in half so nobody sees it and we're going to fill this altar with prayer needs and we're going to get on our face together and pray and seek God as our first fruits to the beginning of the year. Instead of waiting for two or three weeks or two or three months and then we get in trouble, we cry out to God and let's bring our needs to Him right away. And say, God, we're going to intercede for every need. And we're going to have a breakthrough. Can somebody give the Lord a praise this morning? Anybody receive anything from this this morning? Every head bowed, every eye closed just for a moment. Nobody looking around. My prayer right now is that every person will be saved, born again. Have Jesus in your life. Have a home in heaven, name written in the Lamb's book of life. 
I would like to believe everybody is there, but I don't know. I don't know. So a service will never end at Faith Outreach Center that we don't give somebody an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus. Pastor, how do I know that I'm, that I'm saved? How do I know? By asking this question, if something would happen to you tonight, if you would die before the sun goes down, God forbid. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you got Jesus in your heart? You've asked him into your life. If you don't know that, you can right now. You can this morning by simply saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to accept Jesus as my own personal Savior. Or maybe you're here and you used to serve God. You used to be in the mainstream of church ministry. and Maybe you was an elder or a deacon or maybe you served as a, <clears throat> as a leader somewhere. But time and circumstances hurts in your life. Relational relationship breakdowns have kind of taken the luster and the joy away and now you're just if, you, if, if something would happen you'd go to heaven you know that but you're not serving God like you should and God's calling you home saying come home let me touch you afresh let me restore you back to me time is short we don't have that much time left Today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time to serve God. If you're here this morning and you meet either one of those categories, we'll say, Pastor, I want to, I need a fresh touch from God this morning. Would you pray for me? Lift your hand. If you need to make a decision for the Lord right now, just lift your hand. Either, either to come back home and serve Him or come to know Him as your Savior. Is there one that would say, That's me, Pastor, that's me? Stand with me, if you will. Elders, come to the altar, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. If there was ever a time that the church needed to pray, it's today. If there ever a time we need to cry out to God and say, God, not for somebody else, but for me, Lord. Let me know your word like never before. Let me know your heart. <clears throat> If you have a need, come. The altar's open. If you need prayer, if you need a touch from the Lord, if, you say, if, if you're going through something, maybe there's a, in your heart, there's something going on and you need someone to pray for you. The leadership's here for you. Let's sing this together. I'm hungry for you, Lord. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, yes, I'm hungry for you. Need your touch. Oh, seek your face. I need your presence. Oh, I'm hungry for you. If you have a need, come. We'll be closing this service in just a moment. Thank you for allowing the Lord to have his time to move. This is the time we stay and we allow God to, to move in our midst. Hungry for you. If you have a need, come. The altar's open just for you. Hungry for you. Need your touch. Oh, seek your face. Presence. I'm hungry for you. I'm hungry. Need your touch. I seek your face. Well, I need your presence. Hallelujah. I'm hungry for you. Lord, I'm hungry for you. Oh, see your face. Need your 
need your presence. I'd like to ask every one of you that believe that God answers prayer and that God is still on the throne. I want you to reach out and come in agreement with these folks who are receiving prayer. Might be the most serious time in their life. They might be at a crossroads in their life. And we don't want the devil to steal it away. So reach out and pray. Be, be, be an intercessor right now and pray. Come tonight and bring your prayer request. Bring that son or that daughter that's wayward and away from God. Bring that prayer request and let's intercede for, with you. That husband, that wife that's having marital problems, bring that request. Those children in rebellion, bring that request. We can't fix it, but God can. He's a miracle working God. That person is sick and it doesn't seem to be an answer. Bring that prayer request tonight. For you. I'm hungry for you. I need your touch. I want to seek your face. Thank you, thank you, church, for bearing with us. This is so important, this altar call. Lives are being changed, people being touched. As we connect. out and connect church reach out and pray say oh god move i'm hungry for you CC, Kenny, you come down. Len and McDowell, you're going back to Dominican Republic to do missionary work where they have a mission base there. Their elders or deacons in this church served as deacons, still ministers with us, always be. I want you to reach out and we're going to pray and ask God to anoint them. They came back for a few weeks of refreshing, come home for Christmas. New Year's. Now they're going to go back down and take the responsibility that God has placed in their hands to take deaf children, children that can't talk, can't communicate just because they're deaf, not because they're retarded, because they're deaf. And they're teaching them how to communicate, teaching them how to, how to do sign language, teach them how to come out of a, of a backward situation and be responsible citizens because they'll know how to communicate with other people. Don't you think that's awesome? How many of you think that's an awesome, awesome thing? They've taken that challenge. I've been down there. They're changing lives every day. Make sure you love on them before they leave. Make sure you, if you feel like blessing them, bless them, do whatever it takes. They're, they're, giving, they're, they're giving all of their self to respond 
to the call of God and the will of God. Reach out with me. Father, we pray for Land and Magdalia. We ask God that you give them the strength that they need. Keep them walking in divine health. Keep them whole and well. And Lord, that we'll pray this prayer that Paul prayed out of Colossians over them on a regular basis. The Lord, that they'll walk in the anointing. They'll work under the presence of God. The Lord God, they'll prosper in every area of their life. And Lord God, that they might have perceptive. They might be able to perceive, God, the things of knowledge and wisdom and anointing. And God, we pray the safety around them. Pray, Lord God, that no, uh, no enemy or evilness will fall upon them. But God, that you'll, uh, you'll give them protection. You'll post angels around them. And God, strengthen them in all that they do. And God, they'll fulfill the ministry call that you place in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody praise the Lord.